Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here this Lord's Day, and um, I just want to join in welcoming everyone here and to those who are joining by live stream. Um, we have many people who tune in via, uh, via live stream who can't be here in person, and uh, we hope that this is an encouragement to you as I try to look into the camera. We hope this is an encouragement to you, um, and, and what a gift that it is that we have this technology to be able to connect with those um, who can't be here present with us right now in, in the way that, that we and, and they maybe wish. Um, this morning, we are nearing the end of a major series to the book of James that we've entitled Walking in Wisdom. Walking in Wisdom. And uh, last week, Lawrence uh, had a great lesson at the very heart of this letter in the end of James chapter 3, around which everything else in the book of James revolves that was all about the wisdom from above contrasted with the wisdom that emerges from below. There's the Luciferian wisdom that's characterized by pride and selfishness that rears its head upward and throws its shoulders back in arrogance, insistent upon its own way. But then there's that wisdom that comes down from above that is characterized by the one who came down from above, the very word who took on flesh and in every way showed us the humility and the grace and the peaceableness and the gentleness that James describes in that section in chapter 3. And so here's the, the slide that I thought was really helpful from last Sunday that Lawrence used. But I want to look at the last verse from chapter 3 before we get into chapter 4 this morning. It says that a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So after talking about and contrasting this wisdom from above versus the wisdom from below, remember he said that there's a kind of wisdom that's driven by jealousy and envy and selfish ambition that is insistent upon its own way. And he says what that leads to is disorder, chaos, dysfunction, he says, in every evil thing. Or in the words of Lawrence, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad when we use that kind of wisdom. But those who use the wisdom from above, those whose lives are characterized by humility, not grasping, but living life with an open hand, that creates a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of right relationships in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, in friend groups, in, in country, and in, in one day, maybe even our world, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace when we sow with that wisdom from above. And so here's where James turns his attention to next. Two things that he wants to deal with in chapter four. Number one, how this wisdom from below influences our relationships with other people. How it's destructive and ruinous. And then number two, how that wisdom from above can restore our lives to a harvest of right relationships with the people around us. Now, as you may have noticed, a lot of times in a sermon, Lawrence and I, uh, I've kind of followed his lead on this since I've been here. We like to start with some kind of engaging question that needs to be answered, that the text helps us navigate, or maybe some tension that the text of Scripture helps us resolve, and that's kind of a helpful way to start a sermon but this morning, we don't need to come up with any of that because James does the heavy lifting for us. When he asks in verse 1 this uh, captivating question, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Now, that's a great question because so often we go through life persisting in problems and dysfunction and conflict with other people without ever stopping to ask the question, why? Why is all this happening? Why am I always arguing with my parents? Why am I not getting along with friends at school or people in the workplace? Why is there so much quarreling and arguing at this stage in our marriage? 
Why is there all this drama unfolding with uh, the, the people around me or within my church family? Why is this happening? Typically, we just stew in our anger and our bitterness and our resentment without stopping to ask the question, what's the cause? What's the reason for all of this? And maybe the reason we don't stop to ask that question is because we think we already know the answer. It's because everybody around me is an idiot. <laughs> that's kind of how we feel. We wouldn't say that. We wouldn't put it that way, but that's kind of how we feel internally, right? We look at the people around us and, and, and we experience all these problems. We say it's their fault and we, we put the blame on to them. It's, it's their fault. It's the, the, the problem around me is because all of the people around me. But notice what James says next. He follows it up with another question and he says, is it not this? Is, it, is this not the real reason for the conflicts and the fights and the drama? It's that your passions are at war within you. So here's the diagnosis. James says, the problem is not the people around you, but the passions within you. And so think about it like this. Who is the common denominator in every single conflict you've ever had? It's you, right? Like, there's no getting out of that. There's no avoiding it. There's no explanation. You can't reason your way out of it. You can't excuse your way out of it. You have been a part of every single conflict that you have ever witnessed. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there aren't, like we talked about this morning, truly righteous sufferers like Job and ultimately like Jesus. Um, but typically, we're not him, right? We're not usually the righteous suffer. Typically, we have some part to play, maybe even some vital part to play in the conflict, in the tension that's raging in our relationships. And James says the solution is not to point the finger at everyone else, but to look within yourself. It's to look within yourself, to look at your passions or maybe a, a word that's a little bit more easy for us to grasp, it's to, to look inward at our desires or our wants. Because here's another thing that's true of almost every conflict you've been in. You wanted something. You wanted something. That's what is at the heart of all of this. You had some desire, some want. And James says, here's how this goes down. He says, you desire, you want, and you do not have, so you scheme and you kill. You covet, you envy, you have jealousy in your heart, and you can't obtain that thing that the other person has, and so you fight and you wage war in order to take it from them. And this is just the reality of the human story. This is what we see in human history over and over and over again, going all the way back to the beginning, right? In the garden, Adam and Eve, they, they wanted and they coveted the one thing in all creation that they could not have, the one thing that was off limits. And so they reached out in order to take it for themselves. And the same thing happens in the next generation. One chapter over, you have the story of Cain and Abel. And Cain, he envies what his brother Abel has, namely the, the favor and the blessing of God upon his life because he offered a better sacrifice. And so Cain, he reached out to strike his brother in order to take it. And then we fast forward to the end of Genesis, we have Joseph's brothers, and this is maybe my favorite example of this. Joseph's brothers wanted what he had, namely the delight and favor and affection of their father that was funneled to Joseph and not given to them, that was symbolized by that coat of many colors. And so in their envy, in their rage, and ultimately their hatred that stewed over a number of years, they reached out to take for themselves that coat. 
and essentially left their brother for dead, thinking that if they could just take this coat from him, they would gain all that was symbolized by it, the affection and favor of their father. And James, I absolutely believe, had all of these stories in mind as he writes these words here. And the reality is the same thing happens to us. This is the same reason so often for our conflicts today. We want what they have, and so we'll fight and scheme and kill to get it. And maybe on the surface, it's just the material things. Maybe that's what we think it's, it's only about. It's uh, the, the little kid who wants the toy that the other kid has, and so he reaches out to take it. Or in time, that turns into the clothes that this other person has, and so we want what they have, and so we feel like we have to, to fight and uh, maybe demean and put down uh, them so that we can feel better about ourselves, or we envy someone's house or wife or wealth or career, and it's often, it seems on the surface to be just these material things. But in reality, it's the things that that those material possessions or those material goods represent. It's like that coat of many colors. It's not that we so much want the coat as much as what those things symbolize, namely the, the status that someone has that we don't, that's symbolized by perhaps the, the house that they have. We want the attention that someone has that is maybe uh, symbolized by their beauty, and so we long to have that for ourselves or mar their beauty in some way. We long for the favor of other people that's maybe symbolized by a position of authority, and so we say we want that position, and so we'll take them out in order to get the favor that we want. Or perhaps it's the affection or the achievement, or it could be any number of other intangible things that are symbolized by things like that coat of many colors that we reach out to take for ourselves. And James says, this is the reason for the conflicts around you. The problem is not the people around you, but the passions, the desires within you that you feel so strongly about and that you feel are lacking so greatly that you have to reach out and take it from somebody else. But James says, look, here's, here's how to go about it. Look, you do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Now, this is huge. So often we fight and we wrestle and we wonder why we just can't get anywhere, why it's just trench warfare and neither one of us, neither party is moving an inch and we're just fighting and quarreling over and over and over again. We can't get anywhere and, and we wonder how to, to resolve all this. And James says it's, it's because you need to just stop and identify what you really want. Instead of stewing in your, your envy and resentment, just pause and think about what you really want. And and I was thinking about this uh, this week. So often I would hear maybe growing up, if I would do something wrong, if I would cause some conflict with my sister, I would hear something like, you know, go to your room and think about what you've done. And maybe that's good. Maybe that's helpful. I would suggest, not to go against my mother, but I would suggest maybe a different strategy. I'm just curious if this would work. According to James, maybe we should ask not think about what you've done, but think about what you want. Go to your room, go to some private space when you've been in conflict and warfare and you've caused problems with other people and you realize that, go to your room, find some other place and think about what you want. Think about what was that driving motive? What, what was that thing that, that, was, that you wanted that you, you thought was, was this material thing but underneath that was really this core desire for reputation or affection or recognition or, or status. Just pause and think about what you want. And James says, if you could just name it 
and express it, then like 90, maybe 99% of your problems would be solved. Because so often when we approach people with that kind of openness and vulnerability and say, look, I'm sorry, I, I, I was motivated by this desire and here's what I want and here's where I feel like this has been going unmet. Most of the time, people are glad to help you get there. Now, you've got to be willing to negotiate. You can't just say, uh, you ask wrongly and, and you just spend it on your passion. You say, I'm just, I just want my way no matter what. But he says, just pause and identify what it is that you want and articulate that in a humble and open way that says, here's what I really desire. Now, that's may be painful for some of us because that presents ourselves as vulnerable and needy. It, it makes us vulnerable to the attack of the other person to say uh, no. And that's difficult for us to grapple with. But, but what James uh, seems to say is that so much of our conflict is because you're either too oblivious to your own needs and so you walk about causing all this trouble because you don't even know what you want and you're just in the crossfire of other people's desires all the time, or you're too proud to admit that you have them. You're too proud to admit that you do have wants and you do have needs and you do need your spouse or your children or other people in your life to help you meet those. But what James has in mind is not just that we would ask other people, but ultimately that we would ask of God. And this cuts to the real heart of the issue in the real heart of all of our issues. The problem is that we're trying to meet our desires apart from God. And James says, what you need to do is ask. We're trying to get out of this world and take from other people what only God can provide. And so in verse four, James says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Now again, James doesn't pull any punches. Um, I was thinking about this. James, as we've been going through this series, he almost reminds me of like a good mechanic. He's like a little rough around the edges, but he gets to the heart of the issue and he knows how to fix it. And so he comes on strong here, but he says, so whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And then this, or do you suppose it's for no purpose, it's for no reason that scripture says this. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell within us. Now, that quotation uh, is actually not found like explicitly anywhere, at least that I know of in, in the Old Testament. And yet, the idea is on every page. The whole story of scripture could be summarized simply as this. God wants you. God wants you. He desperately longs for you. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in you. God wants you. And he knows what's best for you. And the reason that he yearns jealously over you is because he knows that your desires can only truly be realized in him. And so God's jealous love comes not out of a place of some toxic lover, but out of a place that, that says, I, I know what's best for you. I, I made you, I, to use the words of Psalm 139, I, I formed you and I knit you together in your mother's womb and I know you better than you know yourself. And I, and I, I love you. I want you more than you want your wants. And I know that all of those things that you're chasing after are just going to lead to your ruin and your self-destruction and dysfunction in all your relationships. Your desires can only be realized in him. It reminds me of Psalm 37 in verse 4 when it says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you those desires. But the problem is that like in adulterer, we try to meet those desires somewhere else apart from him. 
And James says what you're really doing in that moment is you are aligning yourself, you are cooperating with the devil, and you're making yourself an enemy of the God who's trying to love you. When I chase after these wants and I reject the God who wants me, I'm aligning myself against the God who's trying to love me. And he says that's what's really ruining your relationships. It's that you're trying to take from other people what only God can provide. You're not satisfied in him. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Verse 6. But he gives more grace. He gives more grace. And I don't know why, but those words just like really hit me this week as I read through this text over and over again. For all the ways that I've caused pain and hurt and brokenness in relationships and damaged other people and hurt other people's feelings and let other people down because of my selfishness and pride that resulted in all this conflict, he gives more grace. And thank God for that. And thank God for what he says next. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Thank God that he doesn't let us persist in our pride that's so self-destructive and damaging and dysfunctional in our relationships with other people. Thank God that he opposes the proud and that he opposes everything that is still proud within me. Thank God that he opposes that within me because of how devastating it can be to my own life and to the people around me. And thank God that he gives grace and more grace and more grace to those who humbly surrender their desires to him. And I love the way that one notable scholar, Lawrence Kelly, put it. This makes two quotes in one sermon. Humility is the gate through which God's grace can flow into your life. Humility is the gate through which God's grace can flow into your life. When, when I come humbly before God and I, I, don't, I don't bow my back in pride and say I'm insistent upon my own way and I work off of the, the jealousy and selfish ambition that characterizes the wisdom from below, the wisdom of this world, and instead I say, Lord, take all my pride. In the words of the song that we sing, make me a servant, take all my pride, and I just open my hand and I give it to, to him. It's like this gate in which God's grace and blessings can just flow into my life and overflow to the people around me and therein yield that harvest of righteousness, that harvest of good and right relationships. And so James says this in verse 7, submit therefore to God. Now, that word submit, like I think still is almost like that spur in our side. Maybe even when you hear it, it just still grinds your gears a little bit because it's just so much a part of our nature to kick against that idea because of that wisdom from below that still has a grip on our hearts. But I hope by now you see the, the freedom that comes in submitting to God. And he says, submit to God or, or surrender therefore to God these desires. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then we'll save that part for a moment. Now, this, this phrase, double-minded, um, is, is this, describing this oscillation between the wisdom from above and the wisdom from below. If you look back to chapter 1, this idea of being double-minded is about how we're hesitant to trust in God's wisdom because we doubt whether or not he really knows or wants what's best for me. All the way back in chapter 1, that's how the double-minded person is described. We're oscillating between God's way and our way because we just can't trust that he knows what's best and that he's truly on our side. We can't trust in God's character. And James says that kind of person 
is a double-minded person unstable in all their ways. Going back and forth because they just can't surrender. But the one who trusts in the Lord, there's something stable about that. When I submit to the Lord, there's something secure and stable about that. It takes away my double-mindedness. And this is one of the most liberating experiences when we can just stop taking our desires into our own hands, grasping at what other people have, and instead just turn our desires over to him. And that's what it means to resist the devil and draw near to God. It's, it's resisting the lies from below that says God is against me or holding something back from me or can't give me what I desire, and so I've got to reach out and take it for myself. And it's drawing near to God, knowing that he wants me and he yearns jealously for me and he knows what's best for me, and so I can safely open my hand and entrust my desires to him. And so finally, James says this. And it might sound uh, strange or maybe striking at first, but he says, skipping down to the middle of that, be wretched, mourn, and weep. Be wretched, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy into gloom. Can you picture that? Can you picture the, the, the person who's there kneeling down, shoulders hunched over, eyes and head bowed low, and, and just feels like weeping? Now, James is not saying that this is supposed to be the perpetual state of the Christian life. I think sometimes when I come across passage like this, in the New Testament, sometimes I think that this is like an all-time like application. The point is not that we would walk around all the time feeling wretched and mournful and, and be weeping. Instead, I think what James is doing is he's depicting the opposite posture of that Luciferian pride. Pride bows its back and lifts up its head and reaches out to take what it wants. And if I ever find myself standing in that Luciferian posture then what I need to do as quickly as I can is the opposite of that. I need to bow down in humility before God's throne of grace and be wretched and mournful about my pride and open my hands to surrender the desires of my heart and trust that God will meet them in the way that he knows is best. And so this isn't the perpetual posture of the Christian life, but when we find ourselves in a position where we're standing proud and tall, insistent upon our own ways, and then we come to the realization of the ways that it has wreaked havoc on our relationships around us, then what we need to do, the response that we need to take, is to do the opposite, to be wretched and mourn and to weep. And, and maybe it would even be a good practice to schedule specific times of prayer to do just this. Again, it's not that we walk around like this all the time, but maybe throughout each week, maybe one time a week, maybe this week, we find a time to just come before God and, and we share the ways that we've noticed the pride and the arrogance in our heart because we've been insistent upon our own ways and tried to meet our desires apart from him. And we just spend some time being wretched before God's throne of grace, handing our desires over to him and saying, God, take all my pride. Because when we do that, here's how James summarizes this whole section. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. 
When I come before God, not bowing my back in pride, but with open hands ready to surrender my desires to him, he raises us up. He lifts us up. And, and he often, often, and maybe sometimes even with more clarity than we would have expected, shows us how to meet those desires in a way that doesn't cause disorder in every evil thing, but he shows us how to meet those deep desires of our heart in a way that yields a harvest of righteousness. And so here's the, the homework for this week. Here's the, the application. These three things. Find some time this week to just get away, to find a, a, a space of solitude and, and to say, number one, uh, I identify the desires that are driving you. And, and maybe it would even help to think about the conflicts and the, the dissension that is existing in your life right now. Maybe it would even help to think about that and to ask the question, what was really motivating me in that moment? And can I get to the bottom of it? Is there some core desire that I felt like I had to take from this other person in order to get, or that they were holding it back from me in some way, or just that I feel this, this desire is being unmet? Identify that desire, that driving desire. And then number two, express that desire to someone else. Now, maybe that's the person that you are actually in conflict with, and oftentimes, again, that can be a very helpful thing. Not to go about in a passive, aggressive stance, waiting for them to figure out what it is that you want, or coming to them and demanding what you want, but after identifying what's really at the bottom of all this, humbly expressing that and making yourself vulnerable to the other person, and if it's not the person that you're in conflict with, find somebody. Find somebody to just share this driving desire. What's been motivating you recently? And I would just say this is the first step to a beautiful life of confession with other people. And then finally, surrender your desire to God in prayer. Whether that's praying with another person who you express this to or praying uh, just in solitude by yourself, um, at least certainly do that. Pray by yourself, surrender this to God, and, and, and do the same thing with God. Say, God, here's the desire, and, and maybe we don't even start there. Maybe it starts with, God, show me my desire. I've noticed that I'm in conflict with other people, and I just feel like I've hit a wall, and we're in trench warfare, and we're not getting anywhere. God, just can you show me what it is that I want and what this other person wants? And God, I ask that in some way you grant that desire to me. You'll fulfill that desire in my heart. And ultimately, God, I surrender that desire to you. I don't go with a clenched fist taking what I want, but with an open hand that says, God, here is all of my wants. Here is all of my desires, and I trust you to meet them, and to meet them in a way that yields that harvest of righteousness. Identify it, express it, and surrender it to God. Now, the final thing in this section, James says, is this, and this is very brief. James says at the close of this section, stop slandering one another. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but you're a judge. And so he says, there's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But he asks this question, who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you to judge your neighbor? And I think you can see how this dovetails back to where James began. What was the problem? It was that they were pointing the finger at other people. They were blaming other people. They were setting themselves as the judge in saying, you're the problem, you're the issue. And James, remember, he said, it's not the, the problem is not the people around you, but the passions within you. And so he ends by saying, look, who are you to judge? Just start by focusing within. And so I want to close just by leaving you with this question, just shortening that question. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you being? Are you being the judge 
Are you setting yourself at the center of the universe in which everyone else's wants and desires have to revolve around you and you're insistent upon your own way and you have that Luciferian pride and posture about your life and in your relationship with other people? Is that who you are? Or do you know who you really are? A beloved child of the God who yearns jealously for the spirit that he's placed within you. And out of that identity, you go forth in your life and relationships with other people, not seeing them as rivals to the resources and the desires that you want, but knowing that all of the desires of your heart are met by your Father who loves you in heaven. Who are you? Would you pray with me as we close? Oh, Lord, our God, thank you for opposing everything that's proud within us. And we ask that you make us a servant and you take all our pride so that we can be humble and lowly inside. Help us not to try to meet our desires apart from you and take from other people but help us just to live life with an open hand ready to receive from you what you know is best be with us lord be with our hearts give us time to seek you in prayer this week we pray this in your son's name amen if you're not yet in right relationship with Jesus, that's where everything begins. A harvest of righteousness begins with the son of righteousness who comes into our hearts and empowers us to live in right relationship with other people. And if we can help you with that this morning through baptism or through prayer, we ask that you come forward now as together we stand and as we sing.